Section 24 of the Normans in Europe by Arthur Henry Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 16. Henry I, 1100 to 1135, Part 1. During the reign of Rufus, Henry had lived partly in Normandy, partly in England. In Normandy, he held the castle of Donfran and the Coutentin, which he had bought from the needy Robert, enjoying here almost independent power over one third of the duchy. He had spent his time and pleasure with his mistress, Nesta, Princess of South Wales, and in literary pursuits, by which he stands in marked contrast to the rest of his family. Thus occupied, and in occasional visits to England to join in the pleasures of the chase, he had taken little part in the quarrels between his brothers, but waited with well-concealed impatience until the time should come for the fulfillment of his father's prophecy. And now the day had come. He had been hunting in the new forest when his brother was killed. On hearing the news, he rode at once to Winchester to secure the royal treasure and claim the crown, and so opportunely had the death of Rufus happened that some even whispered that the murder had been done at his instigation. Robert, having failed to gain the crown of Jerusalem, was now on his way home, bringing with him his Italian bride, Sibylla of Conversana. A few days more, he would have been again in Normandy to demand the crown by the terms of the Treaty of Caen, 1091. But Robert still was absent. The title to the crown was not yet hereditary. It was held, therefore, that an interregnum ensued upon the death of the king. From the last king's death till the proclamation of the new king's peace, all law was at an end, and none could be punished for their lawless deeds. In the face of the universal hatred which Rufus had inspired, and the many smouldering elements of anarchy which existed, this was a forcible argument in Henry's favor, and his promptitude and energy did the rest. In vain William of Breteuil pressed the claims of Robert in the interest of those Norman nobles, who now as ever wished England and Normandy to be united on account of the personal advantages to be gained thereby. He was overruled. The form of election was gone through by the barons who were on the spot, and Henry hastened to London to secure that important town and to press on his coronation. Conscious of the weakness of his title, Henry shrewdly saw that the crown was to be won and held only by ready conciliation of all classes. Hence he forthwith granted a charter which was the first granted by the Norman kings and was considered so valuable that it formed the basis for the future Magna Carta of the reign of John. Know ye, the charter begins, that by the mercy of God and the common counsel of the barons of the whole realm of England, I have been crowned king. Having thus acknowledged the elective character of his crown, he proceeds to specify the abuses of the late reign and to forbid them for the future. The barons were conciliated by the restriction of the feudal dues and aids. The reliefs are to be moderate. The Lord's rights of wardship and marriage are defined. Widows are to be allowed their right of dower. Tenants by night service are freed from all demands except service in the field, and the barons are allowed to bequeath their personal property by will. The lower vassals are conciliated by the promise that their overlords shall do the same to them as the king did to the tenants-in-chief. To the people, peace and good coinage are promised. The fines are to be moderated, the arrears of debt due to the crown remitted. The laws of Edward the Confessor, by which is meant the old institutions, shall be re-established with such amendments as had been made by his father, with the consent of his barons. But forests, as they were in the conqueror's time, are retained with the consent of the barons. To the church he promises that he will not keep the property of vacant benefices, and that he will free them from all unjust exactions. Nor was this all. Anselm was immediately recalled. The bishoprics were filled up by good appointments, and the oppressive minister, Ranulf Flambard, to whom much of the misery of the past reign was attributed, was called to account and imprisoned. Finally, 
Henry's marriage with Matilda, daughter of Malcolm of Scotland, niece of Edgar Atheling, and thus heiress of the Saxon line, was looked upon as a pledge that he meant to rule as an English national king. In these conciliatory measures of Henry I, we see how fortunate it was for England that the crown was not yet hereditary and the value of these early disputed successions. Had the sons of the conqueror succeeded him by strict hereditary right, the crown would have been absolutely despotic. But as it was, each king was forced to lean upon the people, to impose restrictions on his own irresponsibility, and to acknowledge his people's rights and his own duties. The Norman barons, however, resented this English policy, especially were they indignant at Henry's marriage with Matilda. They called the couple sneeringly Goodrich and Godiva, and assisted by Ronald Flambard, who had escaped from the tower, they invited Robert to claim his own in 1101. The invasion was skillfully managed, and many of the barons, headed by Robert of Belem, Count of Alençon in France, and Earl of Shrewsbury in England, and William of Warren, Earl of Surrey, flocked to his standard when he landed at Portsmouth. But the English stood true to Henry. Among the barons, Robert, Count of Melon, afterwards Earl of Leicester, his brother, the Earl of Warwick, and Roger Bygod, supported Henry's cause. Anselm threatened the church's excommunication, and Robert, fearing to try the chance of battle, consented to a peace by which he once more resigned the crown of England and contented himself with the full possession of Normandy and 3,000 marks a year. The quarrel which afterwards ensued between the two brothers was no longer about the crown, but about the power of enforcing obedience on those Norman barons who held property in both countries. In its course, it clearly illustrated the absolute necessity, either that Normandy and England should be under the same ruler, or that the Norman barons should choose whether they would be English or Norman subjects and cease to pay a divided allegiance. If every feudal rebel could fall back upon his possessions in Normandy when driven from England and there prepare a new rebellion against the king, there could be no hope for the peace of either country. No sooner, therefore, had Robert retired than Henry turned upon the barons who had defied his authority. William, Count of Morton, who claimed the earldom of Kent as a nephew and heir of Odo of Bayeux, and Ivo of Grandmenil, who had attempted to introduce the right of private war into England, were driven from the realm. Robert of Belem, Earl of Shrewsbury, who had long been one of the most factious of the nobles, held out in his castles of Shrewsbury, Arundel, and Bridgenorth, until Henry marched against him with the whole force of the nation, and forced him to fly and retire to Normandy. The joy of the English at the fall of these nobles is seen in the triumph of the chronicler Orderic Vitalis. Rejoice all England and King Henry, and thank the Lord God, for you became a free king on the day when you banished Robert of Belem. To all these exiles, Normandy under the weak Robert offered a tempting refuge. Joining with the disaffected nobles there, they reduced the country to a state of utter anarchy. The people filled the churches with their property to save it from the marauding barons. The power of Robert was at an end, and he himself was plundered by his rebellious vassals, so that he often lacked bread to eat and was forced to lie in bed for want of clothes to wear. The cruelties of Robert of Belem surpass belief. He is said to have impaled men and women, and out of wantonness to have plucked out the eyes of a child as he held it at the font. Henry accordingly interfered and complained that his brother had broken his treaty by sheltering the exiles from England. He invaded Normandy in 1104. He was bought off by the cession of the county of Evreux, but two years afterwards, in 1106, he again landed in Normandy to win the Battle of Tinchebray, where his brother and William, Count of Morton, fell into his hands. The Count of Morton was blinded, and Robert, sent a prisoner to the castle of Cardiff, spent the rest of his useless, aimless life in honorable captivity. 
Robert of Belem, who in 1112 fell into Henry's hands, also remained a captive till his death. Thus once more were England and Normandy united. Henry apparently did not assume the title of duke until his brother's death at the age of 80 in 1134. But from the Battle of Tangebray he undertook the government of the duchy. His policy there forms a contrast to that pursued in England. In England he confiscated the estates of all who rebelled. In Normandy, with a few exceptions, he contented himself with garrisoning their castles, lest, by more extreme measures, he might throw the Norman nobles to the side of his jealous suzerain, the King of France. Thus, when Robert of Belem died, he allowed his son William Talva to succeed to the Norman estates of his father. By these wise measures he reduced the nobles to obedience and the country to peace, and in spite of several wars with the king of France, Normandy enjoyed a security which it had never known under the restless, careless hand of Robert. At this time, Wales demanded the attention of Henry. Constant border warfare had continued there between the Welsh and the lords of the marches, and the Welsh had joined the rebellion of Belem. The means adopted by Henry to increase the English influence in Wales were twofold. First, he attempted to subordinate the Welsh church to Canterbury by pressing his nominees into the seas and forcing them to receive consecration from Canterbury, a policy which was deeply resented by the Bishop of St. David's, who claimed metropolitan authority. Secondly, he established in Pembrokeshire in 1111 a colony of Flemings, who at this time were flocking to England, driven from Flanders by one of those inundations of the sea which occurred periodically in their low-lying home. This settlement, near Tenby, did something to introduce the knowledge of the woolen trade and agriculture into Wales, and formed a nucleus of order and advance. But insurrection still continued, and Wales was never quiet until entirely subdued by Edward I. Meanwhile in England, Henry had been engaged in a quarrel with Anselm. Since the reign of William I, a death struggle had been carried on between Pope and Emperor on the question of investitures. The claim to invest the bishops with the ring and crozier, the ecclesiastical symbols of office, had formed a crucial point in the system of Gregory VII. The Church was to be free from the secular power and dependent on the Pope. But how could this be? How could simony be checked? and a recurrence of the shameful abuses of the reign of Rufus prevented, unless the Pope had the undisputed right of thus confirming or annulling elections. This was the papal view, and Anselm, coming fresh from the Council of Rome, where lay investiture had been condemned, refused either to accept the symbols of his office from lay hands, or to pay the homage demanded by the king. When the demand was made, Anselm referred to the canons of the church, Henry answered, What have I to do with a Roman canon? No one shall remain in my land who will not do me homage. Cherishing the customs of his father, he was determined not to abate a jot of his authority over the church. He would exercise that authority more decently than his brother, but that was all. Anselm, true to his papal views, held to his refusal. Unsatisfactory negotiations ensued with Pascal II, who was anxious, if possible, to prevent a quarrel with a new foe until he had humbled the emperor, and Anselm once more went into exile to meet only with lukewarm support from the Pope. In 1105, however, Henry, anxious to gain assistance in his Norman war and fearing the threatened excommunication, once more recalled the archbishop and the following year saw the question settled, as it was sixteen years afterwards between Pope and Emperor at the Diet of Worms. By this compromise the Pope retained the right of investing with the ring and crozier, while the King was to confer the temporalities of the see and receive the oath of fealty from the bishop. Had the King gained the exclusive right of investiture, the independence of the Church would have been endangered she would have become feudalized and subservient, and thus lost the secret of her moral influence. Had the king surrendered all, the church would have formed a separate power within the realm, 
owing allegiance to a distant superior, and have gained a freedom dangerous to the state. As it was, Pope and King obtained all they could reasonably desire. The King was secured in his just right as feudal lord, the bishops could not deny their allegiance in temporal concerns, or rebel without breaking their oath of fealty. The Pope could check the growth of simony and enjoy the supremacy over his clergy as head of the Western Church. The Church, connected with the rest of Christendom and the ecclesiastical centre at Rome, retained her power and vitality. The quarrel had been useful in other ways. In the resistance of Anselm to Rufus and Henry, we see the first constitutional opposition to the irresponsible power of the king. By it, the king was taught that there was a limit to his power, an authority above him with which he must reckon, and the people learnt their right and duty of resisting arbitrary rule. The general ecclesiastical policy of the king was marked by the same spirit of compromise. The Pope had long claimed the right of sending legates into the country as his representatives. These legates did not interfere with the ordinary duties of the archbishop, but were invested with the extraordinary powers enjoyed by the Pope alone. In virtue of this, they took precedence of the archbishop, superintended the ecclesiastical synods, and administered the more important affairs of the church. This right was not denied, but Henry conscious that the due independence of the church might thus be encroached upon, insisted that his consent should first be obtained before the legate could land. The synod might be called when the archbishop chose, but the king's sanction must be obtained before they could meet. The chapters were to enjoy the right of election, but the election must be in the king's court and after his congé d'élire. In every point, Henry maintained the principles of his father's customs and asserted his position as ruler of the national church. But within these limits the freedom of the church and the papal supremacy were allowed, and in the exercise of his control, Henry's conduct was dictated not by caprice, as in the case of William Rufus, but by the dictates of a wise and consistent policy. Anselm did not long survive his return, the rest of his life was devoted to the administration of his see and the enforcement of the celibacy of the clergy. In this, he pursued a more vigorous course than Lanfranc. The married clergy were driven from office, and the act of marriage condemned as absolutely sinful. But the national feeling was always against the papal view. It was constantly evaded, and Anselm's attempt did not meet with complete success. He had been all along striving to establish the system of Hildebrand in England, a system which was distasteful to the English, and therefore he never entirely succeeded. But in the reign of Rufus he had boldly stood forth as the champion of a higher morality against a wicked tyrant, and his opposition to Henry was marked by the same purity and singleness of motive. The ecclesiastical history of the reign is also marked by the foundation of two new sees, those of Ely in 1109 and Carlisle in 1133, and the introduction of the Cistercian Order of Monks into England. This order, founded by an Englishman Stephen Harding at Cito in Burgundy in 1109, devoted themselves to agricultural pursuits, while the earlier orders had betaken themselves chiefly to the towns. The reign of Henry I saw three of their monasteries established in England, those of Waverley in Surrey in 1128, Revo in Northumberland in 1131, and Fountains in Yorkshire in 1132. In England, the Cistercians became great sheep farmers, and many of our most famous houses belonged to the order. No sooner was the question of investiture settled than Henry was called abroad. The possession of Normandy brought Henry into immediate contact with France between 1111 and 1113, where Louis the Sixth was ruling, the first of those great princes to whom is due the ultimate overthrow of feudalism. As a boy he had been sent to the English court with sealed letters from his stepmother in which Henry was requested to kill him. Henry had declined to do so, and thus had a claim to the gratitude of his suzerain, 
but personal ties gave way to motives of public policy. The power of England threatened France, and Louis returned to the traditional policy of the French king in supporting rebellions against the overgrown power of his vassal. The state of Normandy gave him the opportunity to interfere. The disaffected nobles disliked the firmness of Henry's rule. The doubtful claim of Henry to supremacy over the counties of Vexin, Evreux, and Alençon were fruitful causes of dispute. Folk V of Anjou, ever jealous of the Normand power, again claimed the supremacy of Maine on the death of Elie de la Fleche, who had acknowledged the right of Henry. Baldwin VII of Flanders joined the coalition, and a pretender to the duchy was found in William Clito, son of Robert of Normandy. Success, however, smiled on Henry's arms. The Count of Anjou was bought off by the marriage of his daughter to William, Henry's only son. Robert of Belem fell into Henry's hands, and Louis, defeated by Theobald of Blois in the interests of Henry, submitted to the Treaty of Gisors, by which he abandoned the cause of William Clito and acknowledged Henry's lordship over Brittany, Alençon, and Maine. Henry then strengthened his position by the marriage of his illegitimate daughter to Conan of Brittany, and of his legitimate daughter Matilda to the Emperor Henry V, while the acknowledgment of his son William as his heir was wrested from the barons of England and Normandy. War indeed broke out again in 1115, and once more Baldwin of Flanders, Folk of Anjou, and Louis supported the cause of the son of Duke Robert, but Henry was again successful. Baldwin was killed, Folk was again won over, and a skirmish at Brenville, in which Louis was defeated in 1119, brought the Second War to a close. End of Section 24。Section 25 of The Normans in Europe by Arthur Henry Johnson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 16, Henry I, 1100 to 1135, Part 2. At this moment, in 1120, the death of Henry's son William threatened to undo the painful work of years. As he was returning in triumph to England, the ship in which William sailed was wrecked off Barfleur, the prince had managed to gain a boat and pushed off from the sinking ship, but the cries of his sister recalled him to the wreck. The boat was capsized by the rush of the despairing crew, and one alone survived to bring the news to Henry. Crushed by this sudden loss, Henry is said never to have smiled again. The death of the prince was a severe domestic affliction, but that was not all. He was Henry's only son, and no woman had yet ruled in England. Thus the hopes of seeing his family established in England received a cruel blow. The ties of interest which bound Folk of Anjou to Henry were destroyed by the death of William, who had been married to the daughter of the Angevin Count, and Folk once more took up the cause of William Clito in 1124. His daughter Sibylla was affianced to the pretender. Louis the Sixth again threatened to join the coalition, and Henry was forced to engage in another war in Normandy. But fortune favored him once more. Folk shortly after resigned his estates to his eldest son, and marrying the heiress of the kingdom of Jerusalem, accepted the precarious crown. The rebels were discomfited, and three years afterwards, in 1128, the death of William Clito rid Henry of the only competitor for the Duchy of Normandy. Maine, which had been a source of continual trouble to William and his sons, was definitely secured, and Henry's rights as lord over Brittany were acknowledged. The prophecy of William was now fulfilled, and Henry enjoyed a larger dominion than that enjoyed by the conqueror himself. Normandy and Maine were at last definitely united to England. These continental dominions formed part of the English kingdom until they were finally lost in the reign of John. But this triumph, though increasing the power of the English king, was not a benefit to the English people. 
it once more made England part of a great continental kingdom to which her own interests were likely to be sacrificed. It gave the nobles increased power, the results of which were seen in the succeeding reigns. During that of Stephen, for instance, the long wars were due chiefly to the nobles who hoped thereby to increase their independence, and in the reign of Henry II, the power they had thus gained was once more used to rebel against the strong anti-feudal government of the king. Lastly, English nationality could never be established until England was split off from Normandy and the continent and left alone to work out her national life for herself. Secure at last in the possession of Normandy and England, Henry now turned his attention to the question of the succession. Matilda, his wife, had died in 1118. He had afterwards married Adelais of Louvain. His new wife, however, bore him no child, and it remained to secure the succession of Matilda, his daughter, who, on the death of her husband, the emperor, Henry V, had returned a widow to her father's court. The barons were ordered to swear allegiance to her, and shortly afterwards, in 1128, anxious to secure the alliance of Anjou, Henry married her to Geoffrey, the son of Folk. By this means he hoped to win the friendship of the House of Anjou, always so hostile to the Norman power, as he had done before by the marriage of his son William. But the barons declared that their oath of allegiance had been given on the promise that Matilda should not marry a foreigner without their consent, and the hereditary jealousy of the Normans for the Angevin caused many of them to abandon Matilda for the cause of Stephen on Henry's death. Henry was still in Normandy arranging the disputes caused by the marriage when he died in December 1135, it is said from eating too heartily of a dish of lampreys. Amid the constant wars which had disturbed his reign, Henry had found time to improve the administration of the country, and his reign of thirty-six years forms a prelude to that of Henry II, in this as in many other respects. In fact, the three reigns of William I, Henry I, and Henry II, the three great organizers of feudal England, stand closely together. In Henry's quarrel with Anselm, the same principles were involved as in William's dispute with the Pope, and these were again to appear in the quarrel of Becket with Henry II, though the combatants had somewhat changed their ground. We have seen the quarrels between the king and his feudal nobles, which had begun in the reign of William, continued in that of Henry I. The reign of Stephen undid much of Henry's work which was left for Henry II to complete. In this struggle, the kings, in spite of the arbitrary character of their rule, had been striving for the good of the country. The feudal nobles, aiming to establish their independence at the cost of the nation's welfare. It was well for England that her early kings were so strong, for else she might have suffered from the evils of a continental feudalism, and her history might have been a counterpart to that of France. In the administration of justice and in the organization of the executive power, the same connection between the reigns is seen. The same anti-feudal tendency appears, and one reign is illustrative of the other. Henry's father had continued the Anglo-Saxon local courts of the Hundred and the Shire. During the reign of William Rufus they had been suffered to fall into disuse. The nobles probably had tried to encroach upon their jurisdiction or to get rid of them entirely, and under Ranulf Flambard they had been used for the purposes of fiscal extortion and thus became objects of suspicion to the people themselves. These courts Henry now revived, and promised that for the future, when he had need of money, he would not demand it at the ordinary sessions, but summon these courts especially for the purpose. The local courts thus revived, it was necessary to draw them closer to the central court of justice, the Curia Regis, introduced by William his father. The means resorted to were these, the duties of the Curia Regis and its financial committee were systematized, the offices of the justiciary and those of his staff of justices organized. By his circuits to the local courts, their dependence was secured. 
Already the justices, his subordinates, began to take his place, and making their heirs or circuits chiefly to superintend the collection of the royal dues, and therefore in their office as barons of the exchequer, led the way for the definite establishment of justices in heir by Henry II. In some cases, the justices were made sheriffs of several counties, and thus presiding in the regular sessions of the shire courts, connected them closely with the central court of the king. To carry on this work, new officers were required, and Henry, neglecting the old nobility, who had, by their continual rebellions, forfeited all title to his confidence, turned to the lower ranks of the noble order. Thence he created a class of ministerial families, who furnished the sheriffs of the counties, the justices of the curia regis, and the barons of the exchequer, and greatly facilitated Henry's policy. They were indeed unpopular, but for that very reason they served Henry's purpose all the better. They were bound by interest to the crown. They were not too powerful to be brought to justice, and their acts were closely criticized by nobles and by people. The most important of these new ministers was Roger, Bishop of Salisbury. Henry had first met him when a poor priest in Normandy, attracted, as the story runs, by the wit which the poor priest had shown in discerning his impatience to hasten to the hunt, and satisfying it by shortening the service, Henry made him his steward and chaplain. Here his great powers of administration were displayed, and finally he rose to be Bishop of Salisbury and Justiciary. The choice was wisely made. To Roger is chiefly due the fiscal organization of the office and of the Curia Regis, the control of which remained in his family for nearly a century. While thus advancing the administration of justice and introducing order and routine, Henry was not regardless of other interests. His charters to the towns mark a step in the growth of municipal life and a wise recognition of their claims. His police, too, is good. The system of frank pledge was maintained and developed. By this, everyone had to find a surety. If he was a vassal, his lord was answerable. If a freeman, the association of freemen to whom he belonged. The false coiners were heavily punished and a new coinage issued. In every way, the reign of Henry I was a gain to England. It marks a distinct advance in the growth of national life and in the progress of arbitrary but good administrative government. And it is to Henry's credit that he has earned the title of the Lion of Righteousness. But with all, Henry was an irresponsible despot and loved to be so. With all his father's military and administrative sagacity, he was more cruel and perhaps even more tyrannical. He refused to give up the forests. Those who dared gainsay him or rebel against him were punished with merciless rigor, and Henry would listen to no will but his own. His great judicial reforms were probably to be attributed to no higher motive than the love of order and the desire to increase his revenue by the fines of the courts. Hence his heavy taxation, a continual source of lament in the chronicles of the reign. The manifold taxes never ceased. He who had any property was bereaved of it by heavy taxes, and he who had none starved with hunger. His wars in Normandy, his wars against his nobles, all are to be referred to his overmastering selfishness. But fortunately for England, that selfishness was clear-sighted and far-sighted, and his own private aims tallied with the interest of the nation. The nobles were his enemies, he destroyed them, and in doing so destroyed the enemies of the nation. Anarchy was hateful to him. He substituted the reign of routine, and thus prepared the way for law, which might in time itself set a limit to royal responsibility. Thus, while the people could not love him, they respected him, and they feared him, and this accounts for the varying characters left of him by the chroniclers. Men thought differently about him, says Henry of Huntingdon, and after he was dead spoke their minds. Some spoke of splendor, wisdom, prudence, wealth, and victories, some of cruelty, avarice, and lust. The lower classes were very miserable throughout his reign, 
the constant wars rendered taxation necessary, a series of bad harvests and stormy seasons made the burden heavier. Henry, in spite of the support given him by the English, was at heart a foreigner. No Englishman found a place among his ministers. No Englishman found preferment in the church. The two nations were gradually uniting, so that in the reign of Henry II we are told it was difficult to distinguish between them. But yet the English found no recognition of their claims at the hand of their Norman king. And yet, while the English complained, they instinctively supported the king, acknowledged that he sought for peace, and saw that their only hope lay in strengthening the royal power and thereby crushing the feudal nobility. Inflexible in the rigor of justice, he kept his native people in quiet and his barons according to their deserts, says William of Malmesbury, while Henry of Huntington tells us that in the evil times that followed, the very acts of tyranny or of royal willfulness seemed in comparison with the worst state of things present most excellent. Henry was the last of those great Norman kings who, with all their vices, their cruelty, and lust, displayed great talents of organization and adaptation, guided England with a wise, if a strong hand, through the days of her youth, and by their instinctive, though selfish, love of order, paved the way for the ultimate rise of a more stable yet freer government. That, however, was yet in the womb of the future and the Norman period closes in the anarchy of Stephen's reign. Of that reign we do not intend to treat. It forms rather the prelude to the reign of Henry II. The Norman era really ends with Henry I, for Stephen was only a Norman by the spindle side, as was Henry II the Angevin, and throughout the reign all constitutional history is at a standstill. It is a period unexampled in English history, a period during which England suffered all the ills of continental feudalism. Amidst the anarchy of the Civil War, the nobles covered the country with their castles, set authority at defiance, fostered the continuance of discord for their own ends, and strove to establish their selfish independence. In the misery which ensued, the lower classes, both Norman and English, were learning their identity of interest against such men as these, with whom they felt that no truce should be kept. Painfully but surely, they were drawn together into a close national unity, and to an intense yearning for peace, which led them, one and all, to welcome the strong rule of Henry II, and any government which might crush out forever this hateful continental feudalism. Thus the reign of Stephen, though it closes the Norman period in sorrow and shame, was yet a valuable discipline for the country, and formed a secure basis for the reforms of Henry II, who took up the work where Henry I had left it and completed it. We have now traced the course of the great Scandinavian exodus, which beginning in the ninth century stretched over the whole of Europe. Having briefly sketched the fortunes of the less important branches, we have devoted a special attention to the settlements in France which assumed the specific name of Norman. After following their fortunes in France, we have accompanied them in their various settlements in Spain, Italy, and England. Finally, concentrating our attention on the latter country, where their genius receives its most forcible development, we have traced the connection between it and Normandy and in greater detail drawn out their influence on our country and the principles of our government. With the reign of Henry I, the Norman kings reached their highest pitch of power. After him their kingdom passed away, first to the house of Blois, then to that of Anjou. With both these houses they had long been connected, with both an hereditary and deadly hostility had existed from the earliest times. But though the Norman power thus slipped away from the direct descendants of Rollo, the Norman influence was not destroyed in England. They never were driven out. They coalesced with the English and lost their individuality in the common nationality, but they long enjoyed the chief positions in the state, and the Norman administration and executive machinery still lies embedded in our constitution side by side 
with the local institutions of the Anglo-Saxons. It will be well at the close of our survey to cast our eyes abroad and take a last glance at the condition of the other Scandinavian or Norman powers. The continents of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway had long settled down into organized communities, and for half a century had not troubled Europe. Norway still enjoyed her nominal sway over the Orkneys, the Shetlands, and the districts of Sutherland and Caithness in Scotland, these not being ceded to the lowlands till the middle of the fifteenth century. In Iceland, the Free Republic was on the point of being dismembered by the rise of an aristocracy, and one century later was once more to be occupied by Norway. To the west of Scotland lay the sovereignty of the Isles, consisting of the Hebrides and other islands along the coast, as well as certain settlements in Anglesey, Man, and Ireland. This kingdom, under the lords of the Isles, owed allegiance to Norway, but was virtually independent. Of these, Anglesey and Ireland fell to England in the reign of Henry II in 1266. Man long enjoyed semi-independence under its own lords, while the Hebrides were ceded to Scotland in the latter half of the 13th century. In Italy, the Norman kingdom of Apulia and Sicily still belonged to the descendants of Robert Guiscard and maintained constant intercourse with England. Under this line of kings it continued until the end of the 12th century, when their dominion passed away with the hand of Constance the Norman heiress to the emperor Henry VI. In Palestine, the Norman nobles still held some fiefs, and the Frankish name was to continue there, but with fast declining power until the end of the 13th century in 1291. In Russia, the descendants of Rurik still sat on the throne of Kiev until they were subdued by the Tartar invasion of the same century, 1240. Thus the end of the Norman period in England nearly synchronizes with that of their rule elsewhere. They had been the leaders during a most important epoch of European history. They had seen the foundation of most of the future great European powers. For two centuries at least they had been the most influential people in Europe. They had formed the nucleus of cohesion amidst the fluctuating state of European nationalities. Wherever they went, they had shown themselves great warriors, founders, organizers, and administrators. With extraordinary powers of adapting themselves to outward and altered circumstances, they had, while adopting the systems of their conquered subjects, developed them, added to them, and perfected them. To them France owes the establishment of her national kings, nay, almost her very existence as the kingdom of France. Southern Italy, a dynasty under which she enjoyed a prosperity denied her since. Russia, a long line of powerful and clever princes. Iceland, a free republic. England, a stern and harsh schooling indeed, but a useful one. Stern law, the suppression of anarchy, the establishment of order and excellent administration, all essential preliminaries of true progress. And now their work is over. The Norman period is fast waning. New ideas, new forms of government, new systems are to arise, and the great impulse which originally had come from the Scandinavian continents is exhausted. End of section 25. Section 26 of the Normans in Europe by Arthur Henry Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 17. Norman Administration, Part 1. The great constitutional work of the Anglo-Norman period was, as we have seen, the organization of administrative routine. The Norman king was virtually a despotic sovereign. William gained England at a time when the theoretical powers of the Anglo-Saxon king were at their highest, and to these he added the prerogatives of the feudal sovereign, without the practical limits which abroad were found in the independence of the feudal vassals. The nobles enjoyed none of the semi-royal rights or jurisdiction or taxation in their domains, and when William I exacted the oath of homage from every subject at the Council of Serum, 
he destroyed even the authority which the feudal vassals abroad enjoyed over their sub-vassals. The Witangamote, which under the Anglo-Saxons had served as a constitutional check on the powers of the king, was turned into a feudal court, the creature and servant of the sovereign. The king became the lord and source of all justice, and there was no authority in theory or in practice which could gainsay his will. One limit alone remained. The crown still in theory remained elective, and the right of deposition was preserved. Hence the kings, as in the case of Rufus, Henry I, and Stephen, were forced to secure their title by concessions, which unfortunately there was no constitutional means of enforcing. The king, thus powerful in theory and in practice, the chief interest in Norman times necessarily centres around his person, and all that England then gained must be attributed to the royal authority and to the officials who surrounded him. The most important of these originally were the high steward, the chamberlain, the constable, officers exclusively of the royal household, which, though not without analogies in Anglo-Saxon times, had been copied by the Norman dukes from the old officials of the Carolings. Of these officers, the high steward or seneschal acted as supreme official in the royal court. The chamberlain was the financial officer of the royal household. The constable was the quartermaster general of the royal army. He mustered the forces and ordered their disposition on service. He paid the mercenaries and had the jurisdiction over offences against the laws of war and other disputes in the army. The constable subsequently shared his powers with the marshal, an officer of later creation, who besides the share he had in the duties of the constable, took a special cognizance of disputes in the court itself. The steward, the constable, and the marshal each had their separate courts independent of the common law, and in later times these were the object of much complaint, as interfering with the right of a subject to be tried by his peers. By the side of these officers of the household, there rapidly rose a ministerial class who soon supplanted them. The household offices became hereditary in certain families, definitely in the reign of Henry II, and fell back into an honorable position, but one of secondary constitutional importance. The ministerial officers are chiefly these, the justiciary, the treasurer, the chancellor. Of these, the justiciary was in the Norman times by far the most important. The origin of the office is obscure. It was unknown abroad before the Norman conquest, and was therefore of purely Anglo-Norman creation. The first justiciary was William Fitzosborne, the steward or seneschal of William, and this has been taken as an indication that the origin is to be sought in the seneschalship, the duties of which were transferred to this new office. However this may be, Ronald Flambar, the oppressive minister of William Rufus, must be considered the first consolidator of the office, and Roger of Salisbury, the famous minister of Henry I, the final organizer of its duties. His powers growing side by side with the advancing centralization of government, when they reached their climax in the reign of Henry I, were these. He was ex officio regent of the kingdom in the king's absence. He was the president of the Curia Regis, and of its financial committee or session, the exchequer, and he united in his own person all the rights and duties of supreme financial, judicial, and executive officer. He was surrounded by a number of officers who, when sitting in the Curia Regis, were called justices, but in the exchequer, barons of the exchequer. Representing the king, the justiciary went his circuits by which he kept the local courts in due subordination watching over the financial privileges of the king, and held periodical jail deliveries. Already in the time of Henry I, as we have seen, his own officers of justices were beginning to take his place, owing to press of business and increasing centralization. To become, under Henry II, the itinerant justices with regular and fixed circuits. 
the justiciary from the time of Ranulf Flambar was universally an ecclesiastic, probably to prevent the great powers of the office from becoming the prerogative of any one family, or in any sense hereditary, and because churchmen alone could be trusted to administer these distinctly anti-feudal duties faithfully. Next to the justiciary came the treasurer. To him was entrusted the keeping of the royal treasure of Winchester. He was an important officer in the exchequer and received the accounts of the sheriff in that court. The chancellor. This officer, who in after times became the most important of all, and the second subject of the realm next to the archbishop, stood only third in Norman times. The office appears in England as early as the reign of Edward the Confessor, and was probably derived from the Archicancellarius of the Carolings. The derivation of the name Conkelly, or screen, behind which the secretarial work of the household was carried on, tells us of his duties. He was the Secretary of State, and Chief of the Clerks of the King's Court. Always an ecclesiastic, he held the position of Chief Chaplain to the King. He kept the King's conscience, as the phrase went, and administered the revenues of vacant benefices until they were filled up. All these officials were members of the Curia Regis. This term seems to be applied indiscriminately to the Committee of the Commun Concilium and to the Supreme Judicial Court of the Realm, and it is by no means improbable that they were originally one and the same. The Committee of the National Council administering justice in virtue of the King's assumed presence there, or the King's Judicial Court usurping the legislative functions of the National Council. It is, however, with the Curia Regis as a judicial court that we are now concerned. Again, many opinions have been held as to the origin of this court. Some claim for it a purely Saxon origin, and look upon it as representing the committee of the old Wittengemot. By others it is declared to be of purely Norman growth. The truth seems to lie between. No doubt the dukes of Normandy had their curia ducus or feudal court in common with other feudatories. This they brought with them to England, and uniting it with the committee of the Wittengemot turned it into the curia regis. For the rest its powers were of gradual growth, and as they appear under Henry I, were different at once from its Anglo-Saxon and Norman prototypes, a court of Anglo-Norman creation and organization with a double origin. The Curia Regis, then, as a judicial court, was the court of the king sitting to administer justice with his councillors. These were theoretically all the members of the National Council, practically the great officers of state, and a few expressly summoned justices, and in the absence of the king it was presided over by the justiciary. Its original jurisdiction extended to disputes between the tenants in chief and in other cases where leave had been obtained, but its more important duties belonged to it as a court of appeal from the inferior courts. In this way the local courts were united to the central courts, and this connection was much increased when the justices of the Supreme Court became itinerant justices or were made sheriffs, as was the policy of Henry I. When sitting for financial purposes, it was called the Exchequer, and since in Norman times the financial necessities of the king were the primary motives in developing the judicial system, this its financial side was the most important. At two full sessions held at Easter and Michaelmas, the sheriffs appeared and paid the farm of the shire, each county share of the Danegeld, the proceeds of the pleas of the crown, and the feudal dues. These, with the sale of offices and exactions under the forest laws, forming the chief incidents of Norman taxation. The farm of the shire was the sum for which the shire was let to the sheriff, who reimbursed himself from the royal dues, the fines in the court, the profits from the royal domains or from other sources. The Danegeld was a tax levied since Anglo-Saxon times for the defense of the realm, but much increased by William I and Henry I. The pleas of the crown were special offenses, the fines of which went directly to the crown, especially the murdrum, or sum of money payable by each hundred 
in cases where a murder had been committed within their limits. By William I, this was exacted in cases where the murdered man could not be proved to be an Englishman, and the verdict which settled this was called the presentment of Englishry. Of these accounts, the treasurer and the chancellor each kept an account termed the pipe roll of the treasurer and the roll of the chancellor. Cases of dispute were settled by the barons of the exchequer, who went their circuits for this purpose, and these were probably the origin of the later judicial circuits of the justices in air. Under the central court, with its two sides, judicial and financial, worked the local courts of the shire, the hundred, and the manor. These were continued from Anglo-Saxon times, and the procedure remained the same, with the addition of the trial by combat in cases where Normans were concerned, and the inquests by sworn jurors for the purpose of gaining information, such as that required for the compilation of the Doomsday Survey, for the assessment of taxation, and for the settlement of disputes involving land. In the Shire Court, presided over by the Sheriff, the King's nominee, greater causes, civil and criminal, were tried. The Hundred Court, presided over by the Bailiff, settled small disputes of debt, and when presided over by the Sheriff was termed the Sheriff's Leet in criminal matters, the Sheriff's Tourn for holding views of frank pledge in connection with the system of police. The bond between these courts and the Central Court was very slight at first, and it was the work of the Norman period to draw it tighter. William I had for this purpose resorted to the custom of holding three annual sessions of the Curia Regis in the three great towns of the south, Westminster, Winchester, and Gloucester. Henry I sent his barons of the exchequer to sit in the county court for the assessment of revenue. The justices in his reign also began to go their circuits, and were often themselves made sheriffs, by which the subordination of these local courts was effectually secured. Besides these popular courts, there existed also the manorial courts, the forest courts, and the courts of the enfranchised boroughs. End of section 26. Section 27 of the Normans in Europe by Arthur Henry Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 17, Norman Administration, Part 2. The manor was nothing more than the ancient township which had by now fallen to a feudal lord. They had, as before shown, virtually existed in Anglo-Saxon times, in the case of those thanes who had gained independent rights of jurisdiction, conveyed the grants of sack and soak. In Norman times they were so much increased that nearly the whole of England was divided into manors, either of the king or belonging to some lord with the exception of a few enfranchised boroughs. These manors would be thus divided. Part, the lord would keep for his own use, under the name of the demain. The rest would be granted out to freehold tenants on varying terms of tenure, or would form the waste over which the lord retained the right of sporting, while the tenants of the manor might there feed their cattle or cut their turf and peat. Of the demesne again, part was retained in the actual occupation of the lord, his park and farm, which were termed the demesne proper. On the rest, the villains would be settled. Bound to the soil, they might not leave it, and in return for their small holdings they had to till the demesne proper. If the land were sold, they passed with it. In these manners the old town reeve had given up his place to the steward of the lord, but in other respects the procedure was the same as in the popular courts. The rights of jurisdiction varied according to the terms of grant. All had their court baron, representing the gamote of the Anglo-Saxon township, in which by-laws were passed and local business transacted, and all their customary court for the business of the villainage. In these cases the lords were not exempt from the jurisdiction of the hundred court. Others would have by grant courts leet for criminal purposes, and others a right to hold views of frank pledge, as they were called, when the manor would be free from the courts leet and turn of the sheriff respectively. 
in some great baronial jurisdictions, which included almost the whole shire, the lords enjoyed entire independence of the sheriff and the shire court, and the suitors to their courts exemption from all attendance at the popular courts. The number of these greater jurisdictions, which were hereditary, always had a tendency to increase, and were dangerous, not only as decreasing the profits of the popular courts and the crown, but as serving as a basis for baronial tyranny in such times as those of Stephen. There was no means of checking them except by increasing the central power, and it was not till the reign of Henry the Second that they were compelled to admit the justices of heir to exercise jurisdiction in them. There was no privilege to which the Norman kings clung so closely, or which caused so much misery and discontent, as their exclusive right of enjoying the sport in the royal forests. William had desolated the new forest with cold-blooded indifference, and the curse had been visited on his family. Rufus had much increased the forests. Even Henry had refused to part with any when he had to appeal to the people in his charter, and added more to their number. At a somewhat later date it was computed that there were sixty-seven forests, besides thirty chases and seven hundred and eighty-one parks. Over these, the jurisdiction was vested in the forest courts. Here a distinct system of law prevailed. They were ruled by royal officials independent of the ordinary judges of the popular courts and curia regis, not bound by the common law, and irresponsible except to the king. Their laws and customs were their own and variable, until Henry II issued the first forest code. Even then, marked by such severity that it is said the punishment for breach of forest law was heavier than for heresy, nothing proves more strongly the arbitrary rule of the Norman kings or their selfishness than the stubbornness with which they clung to their forests and forest courts. In Anglo-Saxon times, some of the more fortunate boroughs had gained an exemption from the hundred court and enjoyed their own rights of jurisdiction in their ward and borough moats, with an organization similar to that of the popular courts. They still, however, remained subject to the shire court, and the sheriff collected from them the royal dues. By the Norman conquest they fell into the domain of some great lord or of the king, and the status of citizens exactly corresponded with that of the inhabitants of the rural districts, those who held property being termed burgage tenants, corresponding to the soakage tenants, and the lower class of citizens to the villains of the rural manor. For any further advance, they now had to look to the grant of the lord or king in whose domain they lay. Those who were not rich enough to buy these privileges, or were in the domains of some lord who had not the power of granting these immunities, remained much in the condition in which the Norman conquest found them, and survived to the present day in our market towns, with a humble machinery of police and magistracy in connection with their markets. The more privileged gained their charters from king or lord. Having one independent jurisdiction, the next step was to procure an independent administration. This, as was so often the case in Norman times, first took the form of a fiscal question. Hitherto, the sheriff had himself compounded for the dues of the boroughs in the farm of his county, and levied the dues upon the town himself and to his own profit. Probably in many cases more was exacted than was legal, but the towns had no remedy. It was natural, therefore, that they should wish to compound directly with the king or lord, and thus be freed from the common valuation of the shire. This was done by obtaining charters by which the burghers themselves rented the borough dues, paying to the king or lord the rent of the borough, firma burghi, and collected it themselves from the citizens. Thus they were freed from the exactions of the sheriff and changed their varying dues into a fixed and certain rent. The grant of the firm implied an emancipation from villain services, and since the firm was generally granted to the ward mote of the town, all members of that court, holders of land or houses within the borough, henceforth held their land on free burgage tenure. 
This, with a few other privileges, was all that was gained in Norman times. Side by side with the growth of the boroughs, the system of guilds had arisen. For the origin of these, we must look to Anglo-Saxon times. The distinguishing feature of early Teutonic society lay in its strong spirit of local organization, in itself probably a remains of the old family tie. As this family tie became weakened, they seem to have sought for some other personal bond, founded on the analogy of the family which might take its place. Hence the rise of guilds which appear universally in Western Europe, taking various forms, of which the following are the most important. Religious or social guilds. These were probably the earliest and resorted to for some religious purpose, such as prayers for quick and dead, burial of their dead, representation of miracle plays, alms, and good works. Others again formed friendly societies for mutual help and protection. If one misdo, runs one of their bylaws, let all bear it, let all share the same lot. Others, under the name of frith guilds, formed assurance companies against loss or theft, to give compensation when any member had suffered, and to avenge all insults as common ones. It is to these frith guilds that we probably owe the idea which afterwards led to the system of frank pledge. At times, all these objects would be united in one guild. The existence of such associations as these and their rules of membership speak highly for the peace and order-loving character of the people, and as they survived the Norman conquest, they affected our after-history. No rebel or man of bad fame might be enrolled a member, and such offenses worked instant forfeiture, while a rule from a guild of later date speaks highly for their moral and industrial influence. If any man fall poor from using to lie long in bed, and at rising off his bed will not work but go to the tavern, wine, ale, wrestling, and in this manner falleth poor, that man shall never have help or good of the company, neither in life or death, but shall be put out of the company. As trade increased, the same spirit of association led to the rise of merchant and craft guilds. Of these, the merchant guilds probably existed in some few cases before the conquest, but rapidly increased during the Norman period. They were associations of merchants uniting for purposes of mutual assistance in trade. They gained by charters the monopoly of trade, and then gradually obtained the virtual government of the towns by the following means. The guild, including as it did all the important men of the town, would necessarily be members of the borough courts. Thus the members of the guild and the governing body of the town would be composed of the same persons, and guild law would tend to become town law. But further, in some cases the merchant guilds seem themselves to have purchased the firma burgi, and in virtue of this would have the right of assessing the contributions upon the citizens. Thus membership in a merchant guild would be indispensable for the full status of a burgher, who thereby gained a stronger spirit of cooperative union. Still, the governing body of the town and the guild were not as yet identical. Their organization was separate, and the influence of the guild was indirect rather than actual or avowed. Beneath these merchant guilds, the lower craft guilds or associations of craftsmen had begun to arise, but for their future development and the consequent struggle between them and the merchant guilds for the municipal government, we have to wait for a later date. The towns, then, in Norman times, had gained an independent jurisdiction, some independence of administration in fiscal matters and various privileges. But they were still subject to the Shire Court. They were in no sense a corporate unity as they subsequently became, and their organization was still that of the rural hundreds and townships. The condition of London was indeed somewhat more advanced. By the charter of Henry I, it received the firm of the whole county of Middlesex, with the right of appointing the sheriff. The citizens were freed from all jurisdiction of any other shire court, 
and from the obligation of trial by combat, together with other privileges and immunities. They had their folk moat, answering to the shire court elsewhere, their ward moat, corresponding to the rural hundred courts, and their hustings court or weekly meeting of the citizens in common. Still, even London, though far in advance of any other towns, had no municipality as yet. It was, in fact, a civic shire, as the other towns were civic hundreds, and under their folk moat or shire court, the several townships, parishes, and manors of which it was composed retained their separate jurisdiction and organization. The military system of the Norman kings was threefold. 1. The Anglo-Saxon organization of the militia was retained. By this, every man was bound to serve the king on foot in times of danger. They were marshaled under the sheriff of each shire, and each man received the sum of ten shillings from his county to meet the expenses of his service. 2. To this the Normans added the feudal levy, by which every tenant by night service had to furnish one fully armed horseman for forty days in the year, when summoned by the king, either on home or foreign service. The baron led his own knights, and the host was marshalled by the constable and marshal, those knights who held immediately of the crown, appearing with the militia under the sheriff. 3. These levies were further supplemented in time of war by foreign mercenaries of footmen and archers. Thus William I hired mercenaries to resist the invasion of Canute of Denmark in 1085, and Stephen's employment of Flemish and Breton mercenaries at the outbreak of the Civil War alienated many of his partisans. We have spoken of the probable relation which the Curia Regis held to the Commune Concilium or National Council. This national council is to be considered as a continuation of the Anglo-Saxon Wittengemot under the character of a feudal court. Theoretically, all freeholders holding in chief of the crown were members, and on a few great occasions, as at the Council of Salisbury in 1085, such general musters would be made. But in those days, attendance at the royal council was looked upon as a burden rather than a privilege and its ordinary members would accordingly be confined to the archbishops, the bishops, abbots, earls, barons, and knights, and of these, probably only a limited number of the more important would ordinarily appear. The abbots and friars sat in virtue of their holding a barony of the king, the archbishops and bishops as being besides the chief advisers of the crown. The earls, originally the successors of the Anglo-Saxon earls, whose numbers at first small, were increased in the reigns of Henry I and Stephen, gained their dignity by special investiture of the sword of their country by the king. The proceeds of jurisdiction they shared with the sheriff, receiving a third of the fines arising in the shire courts. The barons were the successors of the king's thanes of Anglo-Saxon times. They held in chief of the king and enjoyed a dignity sometimes personal, sometimes territorial. The class was composed of many grades, varying according to their personal qualifications, official duties, and extent of property. The knights, representing the old thanes, were really the lesser barons, in fact, the whole class of tenants by knight service. The powers of the council thus formed theoretically extended to legislation and taxation, the king acknowledged its counsel and consent in the former, and in the latter probably laid before it any plan for increasing the existing taxes. But practically the king was absolute, and its counsel and consent a mere form. The council, however, still enjoyed certain powers. These courts were held annually on the festivals of Easter, Pentecost, and Christmas at the towns of Winchester, Gloucester, and Westminster respectively, when the king wore his crown before his subjects. It formed a court of judicature for trying peers, as in the case of Waltheof in the reign of William I, and of Robert of Belem in that of Henry I. Here also the following business was transacted. The bishops were nominated, until Henry I granted the right of free election to the chapters. Here the earldoms and other dignities would be conferred, questions of policy discussed, 
and ecclesiastical canons ratified, though the archbishops often held an ecclesiastical council at the same time where the canons themselves would be prepared. Even in these matters, the council probably did little more than give its formal assent, and the only point in which its authority was practically exercised was in the election of the king. On those occasions, the royal authority was in abeyance, the nation resumed its rights, only to lose them again as soon as they had elected their future master. Thus the Norman king enjoyed an authority confined indeed within certain theoretical limits, but practically irresponsible, and the government might be inaptly described as a despotism tempered by the elective principle. Of the administration of Normandy during this, as in the earlier period, we have but scanty evidence. All the authorities of which the Grand Coutumier of Normandy is the most important are of later compilation, and of original charters, rolls, or other documents there is a curious dearth. We may be sure, however, that there was a close connection between England and Normandy at this date, though probably owing to the disturbed condition of the duchy, England was considerably in advance. We have noticed before the analogies between the Curia Regis and the Exchequer of England and the Curia Ducis and Exchequer of Normandy. No doubt, England here borrowed largely, especially in the forms of procedure from her foreign sister. But so had she done from Anglo-Saxon institutions, and the debt of Normandy to England was probably as great. Of the municipal life in Normandy, again, we know but little. We hear of sworn communes, and La Main had wrested privileges from William as early as 1073. But in common with the rest of France, the object of municipal freedom in Normandy was more distinctly political than in England, and a comparison of the few charters which remain leads us to the conclusion that in this, as in other matters, the advantage lay with England. In conclusion, the question how far England and Normandy borrowed each from the other will best be answered, if we remember that it was a period of transition and of growth in both countries, and that the administrative systems of each country grew together. End of section 27 Read by Pamela Nagami, M.D. in Encino, California, March 2022. End of the Normans in Europe by Arthur Henry Johnson.